I ran, I ran across this article from 1997 when clearing out my files last week. Mm. That is awesome. Wow. <laughs> that is awesome. I love that. That's one reason <laughs> I was thinking of her. That is really funny. I've, I've opened up boxes. I've got, I found a whole bunch of old stuff that, you know, predates my time with Esther and back to new science and all that. And I've, I've got boxes that I don't know what to do with at this point. We should have a call that's about clearing out files. Okay. <laughs> it couldn't be more timely. I can tell you that. The problem is I enjoy the little discovery. I just hate going through the 500 non-discoveries. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, I, I had a I had a, a couple boxes that I labeled as a time capsule, and uh, so I put a bunch of old tech in there, and I opened them up, and uh, you know I have two Metricom modems. Remember Metricom? Sure. I have two little Metricom modems, and I I, I was like, oh okay, so if Metricom actually like crowdsources a mesh network, they could actually like deliver, and that never happened. And I have a cl a, chi a Clipper chip phone. Ooh, Ooh, nice. One of a few thousand. You want to send it off to Vladimir and see if he wants more privacy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, just saying. Clip it. <laughs> I keep thinking I should just take those boxes and, and re, you know, recycle them entire without looking in them. Then I look and I find like one really valuable thing among 500 other useless things. And so, yeah, that's yeah. the problem. Well, in my case, I've got, you know, White House notes that, you know, captured yeah. some incredibly interesting conversation that, yeah. When I write my write my uh, history of the internet of internet policy in in, in thirty years, <laughs> exactly. Um, Good well, luck. <laughs> write it sooner than that, Mike. I want to read it. <laughs> I'm going to be around in thirty years. <laughs> um, if anybody is interested in processing lots of paper, there is a good Fujitsu makes a printer series called the Scan Snap. Mm -hmm which are like very good for bulk scanning of lots of stuff without being industrial strength, like what the archive needs to use. Um, but they're pretty cool. <laughs> Could use some women on this call. I was just looking around going, where are the women of OGM? Huh. Huh. That is strange. Can you they are in Moscow. Down? I guess not. Hey, see? The universe is providing. Yay. The cheer is for you, Grace. We were yeah. just saying we needed some women on the call. <laughs> Welcome. Greetings. If I were Grace, I would hate that. Yeah. You, you would hate what being the only woman on the call not well anymore. being the not anymore. like oh yay there's a woman on the call it's like yeah thanks guys the brain yeah, just, uh, you know you gotta look at the advantages of the situation that's definitely uh oh, look sense. stacy joined oh damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well you know there's that research that says if you want to make a group smarter you add more women my tea Center for Collective Intelligence. Isn't it actually that you subtract more men? <laughs> <laughs> it, that would be the politically incorrect way of saying it. <laughs> I thought it had something to do with duct tape on the men's mouth. I thought that. <laughs> Somebody once asked me, like, you know, what would be a really good policy for, you know, having better global governance? You know, you think about global governance and, you know, how would you pick the right people? And I was like, well, my first idea. <laughs> It's no men. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, that's actually not the, not the worst idea I've ever heard. So, so Liberia <laughs> um, got a little close to that. Iceland has done pretty well, but I was looking at the Arab, the Arab Spring and I was thinking, you know, what they should do in each country in the Arab Spring is say, no men in any governments for a decade. Mm. Like, let's see if that'll change the power structures and, and fix things. Like, like no men. Um, and I'm wondering, like, um, in many cases around the world, uh, sex strike might be an interesting way to, to sort of bring peace. Because it worked in Liberia. Lysistrata. Uh, and and Lysistrata, exactly. 
Well, you know, the the um, the early Americans, or at least many of them, had a process where in, in council, first the young warriors would speak, um, and then the older, you know, the, the adult men would speak, and then the elder men would speak, and the last ones to speak would be the grandmothers, and that's where the decisions got made. That sounds really familiar to me, Gil. <laughs> it's <was> just... <laughs> <laughs> why, why is that, Ken? I, should, I, I, I think I just said that on your call yesterday. <laughs> it. Like, hmm. <laughs> and wasn't it the grandmothers who were the ones who made the decisions to go to war? Not just the last to speak, but the only ones who can make the decisions to go to war, yeah. too? Yeah. Uh, the, the information I got from, from my teacher was that um, the Council of Grandmothers was essentially in charge of everything because grandmothers were the, the keepers of of life and so any decision that was going to be back if they're going to install a chief they had to be interviewed by the council of grandmothers who would essentially look at them and say when push comes to shove are you going to act on your own behalf or that of the tribe and if a chief made a decision that went against the good of the tribe the council of grandmothers could remove them so there was a very strong you know um emphasis on on the continuity of life and taking care of the whole um and it was the grandmother's responsibility to make sure that that happened so um that's where the power is invested. And, and there was a chief by the name of Skenandoah, who may or may not be the same person they named the Shenandoah Valley after, who said to Franklin Jefferson and, and Washington, you're really screwing this up. You need to give women the vote. And they said, well, we'd love to, but um, we don't think we have enough votes in the, par in, uh, in the Congress to, uh, oh, there we go. We don't have, a, yep, there we go. Franklin says, I speak. We don't mm -hmm. have enough votes in the parliament to um, be able to, uh, not parliament, the Congress or pass that. Uh, same thing with with slavery. They were told if you do slavery, you're gonna your your country will fall apart because slavery is an affront to the human soul. It took us a thousand years to get rid of it. Um, hmm. super interesting. So, um, is this is this the uh, the paper for um, grandmothers? The story that you're saying, Grandmother's Council of the World, Carol Schaefer, because the other hits are all the, the Council of 13 Grandmothers, which is not what, yeah. what you're talking about. This this comes from Franklin Listens and I Speak. Actually, it comes from uh, personal conversations with Paula Underwood before she passed away, but it is also referenced in Franklin Listens when I Speak. Cool. Thank you. Whenever people go to saying women are better stewards on this sort of stuff, I keep in mind that, we, that we, white women broke for Trump. In the election, so you know, gender is no guarantee of anything. Well, it? we're also talking about difference between uh, the the Haudenosaunee and the Iroquois nations um, of the 17th, 17th, 1800s versus um, women today, which is really huge difference. Well, because the thing about the grandmothers, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the grandmothers; it was the council of grandmothers, a group of people in a culture, as well as in their you know gender roles. The other it might have some. Uh, to, it might yeah. have had some similarities to a honeycomb, where the queen, the old queen, might be actually replaced by a takeover. But basically, that she is protected by this council. Where was that? In, in a honeycomb. Yeah, the bees. Oh, not oh, the flowers. The only the bees. Um, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to step over that like comment about women broke for Trump mm -hmm. um, as an evidence right. of something. I mean, you give people two shitty choices. I mean, really, honestly, you can't mm -hmm. um, say that, you know, oh, well, women broke for Trump is any evidence of anything. Well, the, 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 what I took that comment to mean was there was a, a, other demographic factors that were much more pronounced. I mean, black women voted overwhelmingly for Biden. So Absolutely. That's, but I think another demographic is age. And Jerry, one of the most interesting things after the fall of the wall was that certain countries, particularly the Baltic countries, basically said, nobody over the age of 35 gets to be in the government. Mm -hmm. And so you had all these people who just assumed it was a blank slate and did incredible things. Well, that's part of what happened with Estonia. It's like, uh, they, they got their country back, which they haven't had for very many years through their whole history. And uh, then apparently somebody showed up with a Milton Friedman textbook from Chicago, like an expat uh, Estonian. They said, well, 
maybe we should try some of this stuff. And then they started implementing some of that. And then they went all electronic with their government because like, we don't really want to just start generating a lot of paper. So everything in Estonia is electronic. Uh, and they did a whole bunch of really interesting experiments. Um, yeah, and got rid of a lot of the corruption because everything, all procurement was online. There was a lot of transparency. Um, I, I just think it's it, it's unfortunate they're, they're sliding back and now the 35 year olds are 55 and they've developed their own corrupt networks and they're playing the, the politics of polarization, but they're still better off than almost everybody else in that region. Um, Stacy, and then I'm gonna guide us uh, over to the topic that Pete started for us last two weeks ago. Well, I bristle a little bit when I hear like a dichotomy of men and women because we all have masculine and feminine energy and it depends how well balanced we are. You know, there are certain men that are way more in balance than certain women. And I would rather them be making the decisions. Um, yeah, and, and also the idea of how things were way back. So many women, especially in the corporate world, and it may be changing, but I'm just talking about people that I know personally, so it's anecdotal, have really had to adopt some ways where they suppress their own feminine energy. So I think we have to consider that as well. Thanks, Stacey. One of my contacts here in Sweden, he was curious to find out, he's a neuroscientist and he, he wanted to find out um, how his daughters were thinking. So he started to brain scan them and, and then found out some very interesting uh, comparative or benchmarking uh, um, patterns between the male and the female brain. And I do think you have his name in your file somewhere, Jerry. His name uh -huh. is Marcus Heilig. This guy. Yeah, uh, and the, the book he wrote was uh, She, He, and the Brain. Oh, cool. I don't have it here yet, so I will add that. I think what Stacy said was elegantly uh, said and very efficient use of language. Yeah, and I just want to kind of piggyback on that, Stacy, because you I think it's important, both you and Grace speaking to how the you know female energies. And I just wanted to add that too that if you've grown up in a patriarchal kind of society and culture, and I think someone else had mentioned also that culture here is important, that that also shapes the way you think and it shapes what you're, you know, what you think authority should look like and act like. And so that, that I believe that also plays a huge role here as well. But the, the point uh, from uh, Marcus Heilig was that uh, female brain tend to process information uh, more lateral than the, the male brain, which is more vertical uh, processing of, of the data which means that you have it somewhere across in that, which might be perhaps your personality. Someone on our call yesterday said that the uh, density or size of the corpus callosum differs in male and female brains. Does anyone yes. know? Uh, yes, corpus callosum is thicker for women generally, which means there's more inter-hemisphere communication mm -hmm. but, but or the, something like the, that. The, the remarkable uh, phenomena in our time is how tribal communities that have existed for thousands of years and have mostly not been very visible are all of a sudden really popping up because I think people sense a time of uncertainty and danger and risk and they're rallying together to, um, to their roots, right? Where people are familiar and, and seek community to protect themselves. And you see that uh, in, in uh, so many communities that were buried under the Soviet Union before, and they're coming free, and they have been suppressed. Look at Czechia and others, not where, where they have been violently suppressed and, and, and kept in check. And those that escaped you know, during the uh, breakdown of the Soviet Union are now looking in, uh, in horror you know, at the returning back to the subjugation that they experienced. And the Ukrainian people are saying never again, basically, or rather die as a free man than go back into enslaving myself to this. I mean, so it's a fascinating time, really. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, and Ken just found which study? Oh, second, Corpus Colossum, there we go. Um, so let me go back to Pete's statement. Did, did anybody have a chance to rewatch the video from the marker where I sent? A couple of people, good, 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 awesome. In my case, I was watching for the first time. I'm so glad you flagged it. Excellent. And I took notes on it in the way I do in my brain. So these are alphabetic, not chronological from that segment where Pete was talking, but it was, you know, it's not that capitalism sets out the kill of the systems, but that's what happens. Localize the weirdness. Natural selection and collaborating groups is different from individuals. You don't want to leave stewardship of the commons in the hands of nation states. We're trying to find new ways to hook people together to change the way we are doing things to turn the ship around, which might have been maybe a, a central thought here. <laughs> We're in an experiment where social animals create better society. Things seem static in the frame of three to five generations, but change does happen. Uh, small focus teams interoperate well with other small teams. This is These are sort of bits and snippets from Pete from that segment. And I will pass the mic to you for a second if you'd like to like blow some oxygen on the embers. Uh, okay, thanks, Dre. Um... Uh, although I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure how to. <laughs> um, yes, you could, no. <laughs> you could just leave, you could just open a conversation by asking anybody else what it's what these what that segment struck for them. Uh, Mike Nelson and Stacy waved that they had watched the video. Maybe uh, interlocutate with them. Uh, I the the um, maybe maybe a question. That's that, and that's a great way to start. Thank you, Jerry. Um, so, what did you all think? Um, I one of the things is just that shift from, I guess maybe two big shifts. One of them is from individuals thinking about individual selection to thinking about group selection, and then how how groups, you know, how you select for groups and what happens when you do that. And then maybe the other one is, um, uh, no, that's that's good enough. I don't want to muddy the waters too much. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Can I share ahead. a few thoughts and just of ask course. questions? Um, for me, the the revelation and the 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 brain expanding part of the talk was what you just mentioned: the moving to super scale. I mean, we've all heard about how tribes and flocks of geese, I mean, they they evolve as a group and they adopt behaviors that may not be optimal for the individual. But the idea that you can have conflict between capitalism and and communism and the rules of evolution start kicking in, I thought was fascinating. I've spent a lot of life, my life on tech policy issues and watching alternatives to government structures for managing things. And it, it was said very nicely in a tweet this morning from a friend who said, look at, we've got these three things on the internet that are magical. One is the allocation of IP addresses, which is fundamental. Second is the management of domain names, which is a little more complicated. And then we have this thing called Wikipedia. And all three of these are managed by a consensual, <clears throat> decentralized uh, process. You know, there's a little bit of glue from the top that kind of keeps things together, but it's not management or government. It's really coordination that fosters the, the magic cooperation that makes it all work. And I thought <clears throat> there's a whole other chapter to your thesis in looking at how do we manage these new digital resources. And what we're seeing right now with cryptocurrencies and distributed ledgers and the competitions between these different technologies, is another example of where governments may try to control this, but math is math and smart people with cloud computing and other resources can do some pretty cool stuff. And it's, it, 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 is, it is a new mode of doing things. Whether we get across the chasm is the, the other point you made. I thought that the other thing that will stick with me for a long time is that, um, you mentioned the quote where um, the old system is failing, the new system is not yet born, in between be monsters. And, and I think that's, that's part of what we're seeing in a lot of different fields right now, and, and not just national security and not just, uh, the, not just the economy. So it's gonna be an exciting 10 to 15 years 
And somehow we're going to have to figure out a way to build in more resilience and build in more options and build in more coordination and cooperation. And I, I don't, that, that was the unanswered question in your, in your, uh, in your primer is, is how do we build a, uh, enough trust and enough faith in the future that we can make a, a massive shift between one system to another. Although it's a massive shift that happens a hundred shifts at a time or a hundred separate shifts happening each individually. I, I've, got a, 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 I've got some thoughts on, on how the coordination works. Um, and I've been thinking through that in, in OGM and now also in the meta project. Um, and I think the key is uh, small autonomous uh, organizations, really small autonomous organizations that, um, that depend a lot on transparency, um, not absolute transparency, but a lot of transparency and a lot of interchange with other small autonomous organizations, making agreements uh, between each other, formal or informal agreements to, to do things together, to get things done. So I, I think that combination, the the it, it's not just autonomous uh the organizations really need to be focused and and have a, a real mission and um be really a, aware of what their mission wants to be um it's it's kind of like what we imagine democracy is supposed to be like everybody gets a vote kind of but it's and and it's not representational democracy but it's direct democracy but then it's not actually direct democracy of individuals it's vote with your feet in autonomous organizations that are moving, you know, in, in a direction, um, maybe kind of together, maybe less together, but um, the autonomy and the focus on what, what we need, what we think is the right answer is super important. There may be a, a place for gamification in yeah. developing these policies. I, I just, yeah. uh, I, I'm so excited about the tools we have out there and so frustrated and pessimistic about the barriers that stand in the way of, something radical and new but thanks the, for the big so thing well. is the like capitalism or post-capitalism or whatever I'm, I, I don't know if I want to say monster but whatever we have right now that has so much mass behind it um uh it's it's huge right and it's going to take a lot of a lot of kind of reconfiguration to get something that that challenges that well but that's my, 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 my suggestion is that we somehow try to identify the little, the, the individual systems yep. that are going to have to undergo a radical shift one system at a time. I mean, I'm sorry to go on so long. I, I wasn't there for the earlier discussions, so I had a lot of thoughts. But anyway, that's, you know, money is one, voting is another, marketing. I mean, there's, there's about, you know, 15 or 20. Education is probably the best example. Where things are going to change, and I like I like the idea of focusing on those individual autonomous projects that can scale up, link together, grow into something new. Uh, let's go. That John. might also lead uh, to. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Leif. Yeah, um, it, it might lead to that the label is not coordination; it is cultivation, where you are cultivating the threads of the network, the micelle of various uh, independent. Uh, communities into something. So cultivation is probably a key word as a verb uh, for uh, this uh, development and not coordination. Um, thanks, Leif. Let's go John, Doug, Grace, Stewart. Okay, thank you. Great, great uh, beginning. Thanks, Pete. Thanks to everybody who's, you know, coming into this um, really rich conversation. Um, this is a, a, a small point, but but might be might be important. There's a um, these things that happen magically on the internet. Great examples. Um, they're not even though people get passionate, and it's quite possible for people to get passionate and crazy about these, you know, things like names changes or memes. People can get crazy about memes, but it's not life and death right away. It's not bread and butter. Now, what am I saying there? I'm saying that the, the, the area in which this super overarching coordination can emerge less 
not without controversy, but less controversy, is if the issues that the, the super arching coordination is stewarding don't appear to be immediate uh, bread and butter, life and death uh, to the folks who have to accept it. Now, so who should do the bread and butter, life and death? Well, I mean, it, I think a lot of us would say we prefer a world in which there was a local transparent autonomous organization that was doing that. Um, it's going to be a transition. It's going to be a, a messy transition to get to that. But, um, you know, I, I see a couple of evolutions. I, I see um, one is a lot of experiments at that local autonomous organization level and trying to supplement. So like you don't immediately get rid of money. I mean, it might go, it might collapse. You know, it could collapse quite soon. But I mean, if it doesn't collapse, you don't completely get rid of fiat money and you don't completely get rid of national governments, but you gradually try to create these more robust uh, local uh, transparent autonomous organizations that supplement uh, people's livelihood and that buffer them against the craziness uh, as the other parts of the system come apart. And then for the very big overarching things, you, 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 you look for things like those internet examples. I think they're all good, good examples, uh, including the Wikipedia one, uh, which I wanna apply. I wanna apply the Wikipedia model to disinformation, but that's a whole nother topic. I don't wanna introduce that here because we're, we're on a very good topic. I wanna stay with it. Uh, but anyhow, just, just that notion of different, different evolutionary principles operate at different scales, uh, just real quick, the separation of powers, you know, the separation of powers in the federal government is messy, not perfect, blah, blah, blah. But the the, the honeypot that uh, Jerry referred to, you know, the thing that allowed Stalin to come in, the, the honeypot in our system is clearly the executive. You'd rather be the president than a, than a senator or a congressman. You'd rather be a senator or a congressman, generally speaking, than a member, than a justice of the Supreme Court. Why is that? Lots of reasons, you know, but I mean, among them are the fact that the Supreme Court operates within this highly constrained, highly technical process of decision making, where the executive wakes up and says, you know, whatever, you know. So, I mean, that distinction I think is important, and and you putting that distinction into the into the planning for the scope of the organization is is also very important. I think I've spoken long enough. Let's keep going. Oh, um, thank you. We're bringing a whole lot of different ingredients into the soup. I really appreciate it. And it's reminding me of a bunch of stuff that I used to know, but have forgotten I even thought about. Doug, it's, the floor is yours. Okay, I think a key word is the mission. What's the mission of this extended network? So it seems to me the mission has to deal with something that's really pretty essential. So what if we think of the internet as the way of coordinating guaranteed annual income distribution, the adding up of the tasks that society needs to get done and putting them together with what people are willing to do so that you get global coordination across uh, from each according to their skills to each according to their needs mediated by the uh, guaranteed income uh, using the internet. Thank you, Doug. That's, um, it's, it's really interesting. And I was just nosing around in my brain uh, on this idea of what are our next stacks? And I'd forgotten about the book, The Stack, which Grace mentioned in the chat by Benjamin Bratton, which I've not read. But this idea that we're trying to negotiate our way towards some new forms of governance at the social level, at the organizational level, et cetera. So that, that's, this is how I'm sort of clustering these, these thoughts. And I'll, I'll connect uh, this thought to today's notes as well. Um, Grace, you have the floor. I just think the whole way we're having this discussion is it's, it's not accurate. Like this idea that there's this like governance that makes decisions and that that's going to, and there's this big global government. I mean, it's just, it's not how things really happen. 
I'm not sure that's the assumption behind what everybody's saying here. I don't know, there's like a way of approach. I just want to say there's a way of approaching that seems like the block, right? Rather than the stack. Right. And also this idea, oh, everybody's going to get, the, there's going to be a distribution of this UBI from somewhere. I, I just, I don't think of it that way, right? And, and, and so, you know, like that's why I mentioned the stack. Like I'm thinking about it much more like how do we change the circulatory system? And rather than, than um, you know, how do we change these institutions and what's good about the institutions? I mean, that to me, it seems obvious we're going to evolve out of our current general structure and into something else. But I, I actually wanted to go back to the original question that Pete was asking um, about culture and group and coordination. And I think that what we've really lost is the importance of culture and some sort of, I'm gonna call it religion. And, you know, how do you select your group? It's like, well, actually how do you create the frameworks for your group that work for everybody? And how do you deal with, you know, people who are not cooper cooperating and collaborating? And I think that a lot of what we've been doing and we have to be doing at this stage of this transition is selecting our groups for, you know, like that we get to get along and like we can come to OGM, we all behave a certain way and, um, you know, and, and eco villages and cooperatives are, are kind of like these exclusive groups. And religion gave us a way to handle the people who didn't fit into that. And, and I think that we're, there's something about secularism and science, you know, science and whatever that that stuff is meaningless. And I think that stuff is incredibly meaningful and, and, and being able to get along with other people, like simple things like deciding what to do. I don't know, I was staying in Airbnb with some friends and they brought in bananas and I'm like, oh God, bananas, you know? Right, <laughs> like you're gonna put them in the garbage can and they're gonna smell and they're gonna whatever. And, you know, I don't know, I belong to a religion which has you know, all these things that are almost down to that level of detail, like what to do if your tree overhangs your, your neighbor's yard and like, and, and all those things seem kind of silly, but like it's it, the negotiation over the banana breaks down friendships because we don't have religion anymore and we don't have these traditions and oh, if it's got five spots on it, you throw it out and sacrifice it to the gods or whatever, you know? <laughs> so I just feel like, there's so much that religion gave us that because we're so anti-religion today that we don't want to talk about it as part of the stack, but I think it's really important. Uh, you have opened a very big Pandora's box and a lovely one, Grace. Um, it's just full and rich of, of all sorts of things. And <clears throat> I, was, uh, I was pondering in the shower this morning I have some objections to some of the ways religions prioritize certain things. And I like uh, April went through yoga teacher training a couple of years ago and learned about the yamas and the niyamas. And if you go through and read the yamas and the niyamas, they're a very, very good way to live in the world. Like, a, like they, there are instruction sheets with no, they don't give you bizarre, there's, there's like not an awful lot of bizarre advice in there. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things about non-grasping and, uh, uh, I'll go. I'll go to it in my brain when I pass the floor to Stuart. Um, but but they're really good. And then I see so many other religions with like layer after layer of of not just useless but counterproductive craft that is dangerous. And then there's this battle over religion or not religion, and which one and who's better and and you know all that kind of stuff, which spills out and is really like big in the world right now. Like religion isn't that small, a, a huge number of Americans identify as evangelicals, like a huge proportion. Um, I'm sure somebody can Google it and figure out, uh, my guess is 60% or something like that, but anybody else have a guess or know the number? No, I just wanted to say like somebody yeah. was, I, I was actually listening to a podcast and they were talking about the, it wasn't even a podcast, it was a really interesting, I could probably find it, a sub stack or something about that about the similarities between the things that you were supposed to do to prevent COVID and religion, like washing your hands and you know keeping a certain distance and wearing a certain face covering and like the, and and this parallel and how it had become these religious wars and these ritualistic things and which um, 
you know, which authority do you believe? Who's the priest of the, what to do about COVID and, and how this took on a very religious character, which really does in, hint at how strongly these things are important to people. Um, thank you, Grace. Uh, Stuart? Yeah, um, they're important to people, I think, because uh, people uh, don't like to take responsibility. Obama hinted at that during his campaign when he was running, and he got blasted for it. Uh, because, you know, it's much easier to, easier to follow a dictate than to, in, in some ways, uh, think for yourself. Um, I, I, one, one of the things I appreciate uh, being in these conversations is that everybody is uh, so smart and everybody is thinking about the challenges that we are, we are facing. Um, Pete, I thought you did a, just a brilliant job. I had I, I, I had to leave early that day, but when I listened to what you were saying, I said, wow, th this is just um, kind of creating a frame for everything that we're talking about and thinking about. And, and where I went to with it was um, the notion that if, if you look historically, um, the evolution of different kinds of structures of governance uh, kept getting different as the scope that people were exposed to was different. You know, the whole notion of, of, of um, uh, people at one time thought the world was flat, <laughs> all right? And, and so governance kind of structures kept um, evolving and, and now we're at a place where people see that we've got planetary concerns that we've got to be uh, uh, cognizant of. You know, the, the local stuff is real important, but there's also the, the big things, you know, the climate stuff, the pandemic stuff, um, the nuclear holocaust stuff. If we don't have some, um, um, some oh, and people are already thinking about governing out, you know, space stuff, all right? Um, so uh, um, we're all grappling. We're all grappling and everybody has a piece of the solution. Nobody has a, a big solution. And, and what, what rolls around my mind right now, especially because it's in the public conversation is, do, do we have to have a nuclear holocaust before people just really wake up in some way to the fact that we need something, something different? Um, I'm not sure what it is. Um, I thought, uh, I, I, I don't know if it was Ken who alluded to it before, the Council of, of Grandmothers, um, that they appointed a chief, there was a chief, but the check on the chief was a, a, a committee of grandmothers that were, that were, that were, um, that could be trusted to take in many larger <laughs> elements. You know, maybe that's the governance structure uh, going forward on a planetary level. It's a fun time. It really, it really is kind of a fun time. I, and I, I also appreciate, uh, Grace, you're talking about the, um, the bananas. It evoked for me Woody Allen's movie, Bananas, when, when, he made, when, he, when he took over leadership and made the proclamation, everybody who's under 16 is now 16. We will all wear our underwear on the outside. And I forget, I forget what the third one was, but um, yeah, <laughs> that's about as most sense as I can make of the larger uh, schema that we're in right now, a Woody Allen movie called Bananas. It's kind of bananas time. I also thought earlier about the um, um, how the the the, uh, the primates, the uh, Bonobo tribes, deal with uh, difficulty and conflict um, as as also something that you know might have some place in the in the culture and civilization we live in. So thank you all for for being in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Love that, um, Klaus. Yeah, I'm just thinking, not sure I would call it fun, but it's certainly stimulating. <clears throat> and, and so I, I think we, we, we have come to the point of a Yuval Harari, right, where we are 
the clue that binds us is a story. So, so stories that we have come to believe are governing our behavior, are driving our behavior. Now, when you look at the information uh, uh, world out there, our stories are all over the place. You know, we, we, we are clinging to old stories that have lost their relevance. We can't agree on what the new stories really should be because whatever story manifests itself drives everything, drives you know, the politicians we vote into, uh, the, the political structures we embrace and so on. So how do you, how do you help? I mean, how do you engage in this process so I'm, I'm working with, a, uh, with several NGOs uh, and, and mostly on the policy and strategy level. And a lot of them, particularly the older established NGOs are pretty stuck in, in what they can do because the funding comes from you know, sources that may have opinions on how far they can go in specific things. So, so how do you constructively engage in ways that, that changes the story, not by offering solutions, not by pointing out, uh, he, he, not by coming up with ideas on what everybody should be doing, but basically by information. So in my sector, you know, food and agriculture, once people truly understand the impact of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer on the soil and, and the pollution that is causing on, on a larger scale, that makes you think because now you understand why you have an algae bloom in your waterways. Yeah? So, so simply providing enough information that links the system, makes the system transparent, opens up uh, an understanding of issues that, you, that, that impact our daily lives. Uh, I, in, we have come to the point that is, first of all, politically doable, you know, because you're not, you're not, um, telling anybody what to do, particularly when you work with farmers, they don't want to be told what to do, but when you can provide them this information that is, that is, that is undisputable, right? that's science evidence-based information, that changes the relationship, that changes the conversation. So I think the, the best, and for example, Doug sent out you know, Garden World yesterday, and I responded to that because, um, Garden world is a wonderful idea. You know, co-ops are a wonderful idea. Um, people coming together to protect themselves, share their resources, uh, uh, share their gifts, their talents, and so on. That's an, an amazing idea. But how does that really work? How do you, how do you scale something like this? And, and there is this concept you know, of soft franchise. In a, a franchise system is basically the consolidation of know-how and, and tools uh, and, and sourcing that enables you know, a local franchise to be set up uh, swiftly you know, the, without uh, having to do much research. Everything is ready to, uh, to go. Now, a soft franchise allows a modification and customization at the location level because each location has different circumstances, has different uh, issues to deal with, different people, socioeconomics, you know, climate, water, uh, access to capital, and so on. So what, 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 I'm, what I'm thinking about is the vertical integration of knowledge. Right? So if we at the, at the high level come to the point of saying we need to shift into organic practices because we're killing the soil, which is the, the, root called the root of all life. So what does that mean, be shifting into organic practices? What does that mean in, in the application of, uh, of a farmer you know, who, who is raising commodity crops and is being told to use you know, GMO seeds and, uh, and douse them with fertilizers? So how, how, can, how can, what's out there you know, that, that can help them to transition? So the vertical integration of knowledge, that means that, uh, that you can you bring it down to the ground level you know, and with including an understanding why I'm doing it. You know, so there's a higher overarching goal. And when you think about biblical knowledge, I mean, the Bible basically um, laid out rules that helped people to be safe and secure. I mean, kosher food, what is kosher? Kosher in the before refrigeration and before dishwashers, 
you know, talked about separation of food groups that don't belong together, they spoil when you put them together, you know, cross contamination of, uh, and so on, bleeding out an animal so that you don't have any blood left in the muscle structures, which deteriorates faster, that's kosher. You know? Now today we have refrigeration and we have uh, dishwashers, and so that doesn't make that much sense anymore. So today that now it's like a custom, you know? but it used to be a life-saving thing to know and, 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 and to follow. Right? So, so we, we have to reestablish these kinds of, of, of uh, knowing the th things to do, even if we don't necessarily understand all the science behind it and agree on these are the right things to do. That's sort of where, where I'm where I'm steering now we're talking about the farm bill, for example, the farm bill is enormously impactful on on our entire life. Now the everything uh, uh, is governed really amazingly uh, uh, impactful thing. So how do you change? Now you don't want to go in fight with anybody because that doesn't lead anywhere that people who are much more skilled in fighting than we are. So just provide information, provide insights, you know, just open up uh, the, the eyes of, of uh, understanding and, and consciousness to, to, for people who have the capacity, the cognitive capacity to understand and, and respond to it. May I share with you a little story from Festo? Please, let perhaps, Please uh, do. Festo, uh, perhaps you know Festo, it's a pneumatical, well, global company from Germany, um, very skilled, and they have um, a Festo University. It's called Festo Academy. The Festo Academy has roughly around fifty to forty to fifty thousand students a year, uh, especially in Asia, um, and they are using this uh, university to uh, find an alternative to the ownership of the old intellectual property rights. So instead of fighting with the Chinese about the uh, patent laws, et cetera, they are providing precisely what Klaus was referring to, the insight of how to get productive with the help of insights from Festo. And they are extremely successful. Uh, so there, you can find it if you search on the net, F-E-S-T-O. Oh, um, Festo. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and it's so great uh, uh, in their alternative way of operating to the traditional intellectual property laws, uh, which is about, I own this knowledge and therefore I pass it on. And that leads to the franchise conflicts, et cetera. So they are living the message of Klaus uh, that um, you share the insights, not the knowledge. You share the knowing and, you, uh, and that is the cultivation that I was adding into the initial part of the conversation. It's not um, knowledge sharing, it's knowledge cultivation and knowledge um, uh, cell development. Um, can you say more about Festo, um, which uh, their website is really annoying. Um, and I'd love to learn more because they seem to be on a really interesting quest. <clears throat> um, and our notions of ownership versus stewardship private property and intellectual property versus the commons, uh, you know, uh, all that, you know, I, I think that Doug's garden world world is like, hey, mm -hmm. hey, why can't we just provide food and shelter for people in some other, in some other way, because those are the kinds of things that people need. And if they've got food and shelter, everything else can sort of emerge and, and people will be safe and well fed and, and whatnot. But uh, can you say a little bit more about Festo? Yeah, Festo uh, is about pneumatics. Uh, it's a power house. Um, and that is actually a key ingredient for the automation of our factories, which leads to a higher productivity. And this higher productivity is translated into high value adding. So it, it's a key ingredient in the evaluation of your currency. Um, but they have managed to have this culture of Festo um, growing. Um, and I, I'm really impressed how they handle the uh, issues that US is fighting with the Chinese about the intellectual property laws. They don't fight about it. 
they, they share the insights of, of um, the, which is the cultivation of relationships. And that's why they have so many students, four to 50,000 students a year in Fester Academy. That is a big university uh, in a way. And um, that leadership is so impressive. So that perhaps we, we should come back to that and invite someone from there to share the insights. Because if you think about it from a different angle, you, we have an emerging uh, intellectual property battle between East and West and between China and the US. And if Festo is sitting on a different paradigm on these relationships handling, which are much more related to uh, the human dimensions than the technical dimension, in spite of being a very technical company, uh, operated by compressed air, which is pneumatics. Super interesting. Thank you. And thanks for doing some of the searching, Pete, uh, and finding stuff. Um, where are we in this conversation? And, and um, how might we guide it? Sort of. I can add another picture which you can yeah. help us to, to upload, and that is from World Values Survey. Uh, and it's a map on values uh, mapping around right. the world. And uh, it shows that uh, some countries are uh, progressing think... very well based on two dimensions freedom to think, exactly, freedom to think and uh, secular dimensions. And if you look at this one, you can see that you have um, Japan much more to the east in the picture than you have US. And what could be the reason behind that? Survival versus self-expression and then traditional versus secular uh, values. Yeah, uh, yeah this, this, this got some attention recently and looks really interesting. And I haven't had any interesting conversations about it. So thanks for bringing it into the conversation. One thing that I learned at uh, IBM was that they had been doing these personality studies of values of almost every employee at IBM for 30, dec 30 years, half a million people. And they could use that very quantitative data to plot where people in different countries fall mm -hmm. in different cultures. And it was, it was so funny because it was so stereotypical. I mean, Americans were off the scale in an individuality. <laughs> the Japanese were the other side, very much communitarian. The Latin Americans tended to salute when the strong man told them what to do. Um, it, it was really fascinating how, how this, this data came out and, and they, they, they did it for a long time. And this was a survey of IBM employees. IBM employees from 1960s right. to about 2015, I think. I'll see if I can find the best, best write-up on it. It was uh, the life work of this one guy. And it, oh, wow. it really was impressive. I, 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 it hasn't gotten as much attention as it should. Let me, let me get back to your point, though, about what do we do with this. Um, I, I wanted to hit on what Grace had said long about 15 minutes ago, saying, you know, we seem to be starting with the top. And, and some of the words that people used might have sounded that way, but I, I, I don't think there's a global system and I don't think the people on the call think there's a global system, but there is a, a, some kind of cathedral or building or pyramid that we're, we build out of different building blocks that lead to a system. And, and every time the US or somebody else has tried to parachute into a new culture and impose, <laughs> well, it hasn't worked very well. But countries that develop an organic system do it one system at a time. And we just talked about intellectual property. In my world, I would argue encryption is a big decision. Um, uh, copyright online is another decision. Data localization, do I hoard my data, keep it in the country? There, there's a bunch of these decisions and they're you know, 40 or 50 big decisions, currency, you know, do you reward maternity leave or do you reward um, 
you know, do you take put more focus on elder care? I mean, there, there's a bunch of these big decisions that reflect the values and lead the country to go down a particular direction. And I, I'd just love to know if anybody's seen any good assessment of the the 15 or 20 most important values decisions that countries have to make and how that leads to something different. Because it obviously we get very different systems. Um, love the we question. have been doing this for some decades now. It, it started in a collaboration with the University of Hong Kong uh, on um, values mapping. Uh, and then we escalated that to nations. So if you Google on the national intellectual capital, you can find um, roughly 60 countries being mapped on, on some 60 indicators um, over some 15 years. Um, and that could uh, lead to another discussion of what are the driving ones, but we can come back to that. It, it relates to um, also research that started in Santa Clara with um, a professor and his friend. They were doing a values mapping of a similar type like IBM. Um, and um, his name was Brian Hall. Okay. And his colleague's name was Benjamin Tonna. And, and is anybody taking these value maps and try to understand how they relate to um, political structures and governance structures in the private sector. I mean, Francis Fukuyama wrote this book called Trust, which I think still think is the best thing he ever wrote. And he looked at six countries, three were high trust countries and three were low trust countries. And he really did a great job of saying this one factor completely influenced whether there was a strongman type of government or a bottom-up town meeting type of government. And in Italy, which is a low trust government uh, system, very much focused on family firms where you could trust your family and nobody else. I mean, it was really beautiful the way he wove those things together. But I, I haven't seen anybody really develop it much more in the 15 years since. They, they do the values mapping, but they don't indicate how that results in a different community structure. Partially it does actually, and you can see it in, in work uh, some years back by Hans Rusling. Uh, he was doing the, the, this with a, a software called Gapminder, okay. uh, which was acquired by Microsoft. Uh, and then it has uh, been uh, growing. And I, I used it also for this national intellectual capital mapping of uh, these 60 countries. How so do you spell Hans's last name? He's on the, oh, on, right, right here, Hans Rosling, R-O-S. Oh, Rosling, okay, yeah, of course, so we know him well, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Gapminder guy. Yeah. Whose son is still doing that work. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, thanks. Go ahead. Well, I, I do think that uh, your observation is very good and um, we could uh, come a long way by um, reiterating together with uh, Rusling, the family of Rusling, because it's both his son and, and uh, daughter-in-law working on it, Right. this gap, gap minder. But what we found in our work with, on intellectual capital is that the most important um, indicator for um, institutions as well as nations is um, renewal. So if you look at an institution and, and you can actually uh, uh, see very, very quickly whether that institution is renewing or not. Uh, and then you can refine, of course, the, the indicators. But basically it is the speed of renewal that avoids you from drowning. Um, Stuart, you've been waiting patiently. And then Doug. Thanks. So just, uh, um, kind of reverting back to, to Pete's thesis a little bit in terms of us waiting for the next <clears throat> step of evolution. I, I think everything that everybody says has, has value and yet there's an element in uh, an elephant in the, <laughs> the, ele the, yeah, the elephant right now is this guy named Putin in Russia 
who's kind of rattling his saber with, with nuclear holocaust. And so at some level, given that we've created this incredible destructive capacity, what is the international planetary governance system that takes care of in some way bad actors? I mean, to me, without that context, you've got people who are um, kind of insecure in whatever it is that they're doing day to day or moment to moment. At a domestic level, you know, if somebody acts out like that, you take them and you, you lock them up, you separate them. How do, we, how do we deal with this? How do we grapple with this at a, at a global level given the, the large inst instruments of, um, of destruction, both in the form of like a nuclear holocaust, but also in the form of, you know, um, we've had a natural pandemic, but we also have the capacity for biological warfare. How do we create a, 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 a planetary governance system that is, is, um, is effective? Because it seems if you think periodically, I mean, the last, the last kind of um, craziness was, was Hitler, you know, running on the loose in, in Europe and, and people are, are, you know, saying that, that, that Putin might do the same thing. Um, and how do you balance that <clears throat> against Eisenhower's warning in the military industrial complex? Um, uh, I don't have any answers to any of these things, but it's the kind of stuff that I, um, I, 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 I noodle with, and I'm, I'm curious about, uh, people's thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks, Stuart. Um, I'll come back to it when I've got time, but, uh, but something about design from trust is explicitly about what you just said. So I'll, when I, I'll wait my turn. Uh, Leif, if you could put your hand down while we're going, and then let's go Doug, Pete, Grace. Well, it seems to me that values are organized around the way we do food and shelter, but the value studies almost never talk about food and shelter, which seems to me to lose the key leverage points for how things change. Uh, with regards to Putin, uh, I've been reading a history of the Ukraine, and it's amazing, the struggle over that piece of land between starting more recently the Communist Party in Russia and the Communist Party in Ukraine, and whether you're going to have Ukrainian-speaking schools or Russian-speaking schools, and it goes back through with the Ukraine being dominated by the Mongols, uh, by the Vikings, uh, it's extraordinarily complex history. So I think one way to deal with people like Putin is to be much smarter about what are the conditions that create that kind of leadership. It's not coming out of nowhere. And I think we're very weak in our understanding of the complexities and subtleties of the historical process. Thanks, Doug. And, and uh, in my brain, I sometimes try to track things. I have like all the popes, <clears throat> you know, uh, head to tail because Wikipedia pages say follow this person and this and then there's the schisms in the church and then there's the the major you know uh eastern orthodox and then there's this and that and and I and I tried to do it for like uh kings and queens of England for example freaking too complicated I I could not tell you the history of just England just this little island off the coast of, of Europe and so you you dip into any piece any you know couple square meters of dirt on the earth and there's a, a tremendous amount of history that we don't know that we've forgotten that got squished and intentionally erased et cetera et cetera and that just plays in because because maybe intergenerational trauma because I don't know what else but uh, we need to understand more history and then somehow get over mm -hmm. some of the trauma uh, but un, but un acknowledging it is often the path to getting over it sorry to go on for long on that. Um, Pete, Grace, then me. Um, thanks, and thanks everybody for an awesome conversation. Um, I, I wanted to. Um, I, I was especially moved by Mike's uh, Mike's comment that you know there's I, I forget how many thought 30, 40, 50 um, kind of like big pol pol kinds of decisions that if you if you make them you shape a lot of of uh, a nation's the way a nation works. Um, I, I kind of guess there's probably more than that, um, probably a couple hundred or whatever, but um, the, 
and and listening to Mike and his calm, soothing voice is like, oh wow, we could actually manage politics. That that would be an awesome, wonderful thing. Um, uh, uh, I. I have apparently lived in our, our United States uh, for a little bit too long and have come to believe that, um, that I, I appreciate that people are doing that work and um, I find it a little bit hard to believe in the um, management of the system. Uh, the, I, I think, so one of my, one of my lessons from uh, my, my pitch last week or one of my, one of my core thoughts is that not that it's it's that we don't really get to decide what hyperscale social structures do um, we can influence them and uh you know we can influence them in groups like a group that's super interested in elder care or uh women's rights or um you know infant infant mortality or something like that they can make a lot of difference and we have seen that just one or a few people uh, can like torque the system around. Um, uh, so we have in the United States, at least, we have a, a kind of a dual is the wrong way to say it, but we have a, a split brain kind of way of managing the system or the way that we govern. Our governance, you know, is nominally kind of democratic process, blah, blah, blah. There's also a shadow, a shadow thing where um, the, the rules of the games that the founding fathers set up and then the turns that um, mostly probably rich entitled people took over the next 200 years or so ended up with a system that is highly manipulable in certain ways. So you can manipulate um, uh, voting with, um, uh, with the way that you've set up boundaries. Uh, you can manipulate public opinion by setting up the right kinds of think tanks and, and hiding behind the fact that you've got 100 or 200 think tanks that sound like they're really reasonable and um, swamp you know, everything. It turns out, oddly enough, that, that uh, you can actually just attack a bunch of social media um, outlets with probably hundreds of thousands of bots and like swing public opinion back and forth. And then that pub public opinion, you know, uh, is the tail wagging of the dog of our, our, our putative governance processes that make it do stupid things like, like fricking dropping the mask mandate. This one is a, a one that pisses me off personally. Um, I don't know if y'all are maskers or anti-maskers, but I'm pissed about this and depressed and freaked out. Um, not, not so much even that we dropped the mask mandate, but that we did it for the wrong reasons and in the wrong way. And, and uh, now as a person who likes to wear a mask out in public, um, I feel like I'm, I'm taking my life in my hand, not my life, my, my person in my hands. I'm worried about getting hit. Um, I'm worried about, you know, things I'm getting, I, I'm worried about getting attacked. And, you know, that, that was a weird decision. I, you know, whether or not I feel like it was the right decision, the process that got us to undo uh, mask mandate on transportation was just like inane, uh, like much of the Trump presidency was. It's just inane watching the system getting yanked around by a grifter. You know, it's like, what the hell, guys? This is our, our governance system that can just get played with by a, a couple of, you know, uh, a well-meaning or a, a anti-well-meaning fool and... Uh, a cadre of people around him in different kinds of things. This is like insane. So anyway, we've got this, a, a thing that we don't, I think we don't pay enough attention to is we have emergent social structures and they are huge and they do amazingly powerful things to our lives. And when we say, well, I wish, you know, I wish, you know, some crazy federal judge didn't have the power to yank our, our whole public health system around, you know, like that kind of wish is something that you speak into the air and it evaporates because that's it, there's no handle for that you know there's no handle on that emergent process so i think i i have two things um one thing that we didn't kind of get around to in this in this conversation was scale um for better or for worse uh a, a big social organization commands more resources than a little one and can end up bullying the little ones to death until and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger so um just as kind of a blanket observation uh we 
we love our scale because it lets us do amazing and wonderful things, build the internet and talk to each other on Zoom and stuff like that. Um, uh, advertise uh, various uh, junk food things and then all can eat the same junk food anywhere in the world. Um, uh, let's just go to the moon and things like that. I, I think scale has done some wonderful things for us, but it is freaking dangerous. Um, so my, my poster child for scale and, and silly scale is Facebook, actually. Why the heck would we want one system with one, you know, kind of weird, whatever, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's background is, deciding how billions, literally billions of people like exchange information and work together in social cultures and stuff like that. Doesn't that sound like a recipe for fricking disaster to anybody else? I mean, it is like insane. You know, it gives Mark Zuckerberg and whatever whims his tortured psychology has from however he grew up control over like I don't know, 20 or 30% of the mind of humanity. What? <laughs> you know, and then we can get into, uh, you know, the, the Murdoch, you know, folks and, and stuff like that. We've, we, we end up letting these hyperscale social structures get so massive that they have so much power that we're, we feel powerless against them. And then we come up with cool ideas. Well, I'm going to quit Facebook and that'll make a big difference. It doesn't because there's still a couple billion people on Facebook doing the Facebook thing. Um, another, another poster child for scale for me is the US military. Um, uh, I super appreciate the fact that I feel warm and secure in my home mostly. And I don't worry too much that um, some president is going to you know, take over the, the government and say, hey, uh, military, now I own you and you can do this in, in, uh, in San Diego and, you know, make my life hell. I don't worry about that too much. I actually do worry about it a lot. But, um, but on the other hand, we, over the past, you know, uh, especially like, you know, World War I, World War II, and then on, military industrial complex got so, US military industrial complex got so huge that it rules the world. And, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, the, I, I, I appreciate a lot of that. And I have a little bit of guilty feelings about appreciating it because I don't want, uh, you know, the US and its military force stomping around the world deciding what happens or, or worse, you know, the Congress having some wild ass plan of doing something and then, you know, and then the military ends up essentially enforcing it. Um, it's, it's dangerous, it's crazy, it's, it's literally like insane. It's, it's uh, you know, an insanity that we have these massive social structures that, that get away from us and then we can't do anything about them. So, so if we wanted a different government in the US, how would that work? Um, you know, if we, if we wanted it radically different, could we like turn a switch? And it's like, no, we've got too much, too much, um, too much inertia and too much at the, at the root of it, you know, like, like dozens of times more military strength than we need that's going to stop that from happening. Um, I don't mean to pick necessarily just on Facebook or, or the U US military um, or the, you know, the US. There's, there's just a, I, I use those as examples of scale gone insane. And I think the answer is, you know, I, I think, I think it was Mike also that said 15 years. I think we're in for a hundred years of, of craziness. Um, but <laughs> the, the end of that is uh, little groups of, of people living locally doing the, the right thing for them um, or the wrong things for them. As it turns out, not everybody, not every group is going to be virtuous, but um, we need to decentralize the power structures um, in the world. And I don't, I don't, you know, it's like power structure is such a weird kind of like, it's, I, I mean it more fundamentally than, than a, a quick gloss. Um, concentration and, and scale, hyperscale is just freaking dangerous. Um, I have a, I have a weird, I have two weird, weird touchstones off of uh, my favorite social platform, which is also highly centralized and too big. Twitter, 
Um, one of them, uh, this is an interesting person who I don't know if she's right or not, but she's like, dude, I started looking at the anti CRT legislation in Florida. And I think, I think, I, I don't want to feel like a, a, a crackpot, but I think it's just the Carlisle group wanted to be the only book publishers um, selling textbooks in Florida. And that's the kind of weird, I don't know if this one is true or not, but that's the kind of weird stuff. You know, it's like, a small group of white men probably somewhere go, well, we need to take over this market. Let's torque all of society around um, uh, so that we get, you know, our, our, you know, billion dollars of profit or whatever. The, the other one, and I've mixed up the, the uh, so that was Judy Stern came up with that. And that's this tweet, the previous tweet, uh, Yishan, I, I actually don't know his background. Um, I think he was uh, managing a lot of Reddit, um, but he talks about, um, there's an interesting thing going on Twitter, Elon Musk uh, threatened or offered or, or however you would use the verb with Musk uh, to buy out Twitter and then run it the right way. And um, it's a really interesting thread about Dude, uh, so there's a thing, people get uh, a hair up their, their butt about free speech and you're uh, canceling me or you're, you're censoring me or whatever. And, and uh, so his, his rant, the terror, he, uh, it's not a terror, it's a rant, long, long rant. He's like, dude, Elon Musk, with whatever he thinks about free speech and that every, anybody can speak on Twitter, his point, the point that he makes for me, and he doesn't, he's not trying to make this point, but the point I see is that what he says is in a hyperscale social network, you get weird effects and you have to stomp things out. Um, thoughts actually do matter at scale and you end up humanity, humans and the way they work, if you, if you have a billion of them talking to each other, you get these weird pockets of people that you literally have to stop them talking um, or like really bad things happen in the real world. Um, so the, the answer to me is like, you know, I don't care too much whether or not Musk buys Twitter and, and I actually love Twitter. So I feel bad about, about thinking that it's fun, even that it's hyperscale. The, the answer to me isn't better management of Twitter. It's like, why do we have Twitter or Facebook with billions of people? Why don't we, why don't we cap our social networks at about 10,000? You know, do you really need to talk to more than 10,000 of the right people? The, the solution that the big hyperscale networks gave us was finding the right thousand people that you want to talk to. Um, but we don't have to do that by having inter, interlocking access to a billion people. All you need is the right thousand people. And I think you can do that by joining a couple 10,000 member social networks instead of one, you know, one that's 3 billion people. So um, I don't know how you would affect that. Um, I, I actually really like Stuart's uh, question. You know, how do you, um, how do you, the, the way I translated Stuart's question about um, uh, governance of big things is uh, how do we steward the commons? Um, pick a commons, air, water, food, whatever. Um, uh, so I've got, I've, I've still got a conflict in my head, right? The, I think the right way to do it isn't like massive scale. So how do you govern a commons that has massive scale like air or water or soil, um, uh, but do it with small 10,000, you know, member clans across the world? Um, and I think part of the answer is sovereigns that focus on uh, um, council councils. Uh, so, you know, a bunch of 10,000 member communities all kind of contribute to a, a more hierarchical thing that's, that collects and, and stewards on behalf of, you know, 100, 10,000 member groups or something like that. And you kind of work your way up from there. Um, but uh but so i feel weird sitting in 2022 going okay um uh we we fucked up and we let things get too big and the and the main answer is back to small but um it's hard and and i think i think uh in 200 years somebody listening to this is going 
I don't know, man, scale sounds pretty good. And, and it, it solved a lot of problems. We should go back to doing that. I think that's going to happen in a couple hundred years. But, um, but from my point of view, right, right now, it's like, you know, it's a big mess and it wasn't worth whatever we got, uh, even, even all the cool stuff like Twitter and uh, the Apollo missions and, you know, whatever um, uh, amazing healthcare that we've got, uh, healthcare innovations, even if we can't deliver it. Um, it's not worth the, uh, the heartache of destroying the ecosystems and um, being, being dragged around by a few crazy people because they've, they're in the right position in a hyperscale social structure. Anyway, thanks. Um, <clears throat> we, we, are, we have a lot to say and we're not gonna make it through the queue as it currently stands. Grace, the floor is yours. I just think it's so cool how um, things seem to like come around by the time they come around to me. I'm like, oh, and that's exactly the point I wanted to continue on. Nice. Um, but it, it really is about this, like, you know, the question, uh, the, the question that Stuart asked, like, how do you manage this, like, you know, whatever it is, the big global problem. And I think what it is, is more like a sensory system. I think about sensory and response systems like we have in our bodies or in natural systems and it's like okay you know we're having a drink and maybe we're having a few too many drinks and if we have way too many drinks we pass out right and so there's <laughs> like sensory systems at different levels and I think and and basically you want to handle it at the smallest possible level like oh my toe hurts right now I better look but usually I ignore that for a while, right? And then pretty soon I'm limping and then maybe my hip hurts, right? Like there's that, you know, and we're all, we all have a different level at which we're like, oh, I better see a doctor. So that's kind of how I think about these global systems. It's really interesting. I was listening to this interview with this guy who had been on the Ukrainian border and he was talking about how there were all these different groups at the Ukrainian border. And, you know, there was like one with people with cerebral palsy that were trying to take care of people who had children or adults who were uh, disabled. And there was, you know, one who was the, you know, whatever it was, this speaking of you know, people with, with relatives in Italy. And like, they kind of all knew who each other were and they sent you to the right tent when you came over the border on, at Poland. And it's kind of like, okay, it's a bunch of sensory systems that aren't really tightly coordinated, but they all know each other. And there's like this way of, of handling the situation. And so I think about it that way, like that really when you're having, I don't know, my neighbors aren't recycling, you know, you just go and knock on the door, but if that whole town isn't recycling, then the towns around them go, hey, listen, you guys, you can't keep throwing your garbage like that. And trying to deal with these things at the lowest possible level when you can. Um, and it doesn't mean even everybody has to agree. It's just enough people had to agree to do it. Again, like the camp, you know, the people who are, who are handling the refugees at the, at the Polish border. It's like, you just have to send enough, there's no vote, there's no decision, but you have to send enough people over to the, to the place where the swelling is happening, you know, and, you know, put a few ice packs on it or whatever it is in this case, you know, and hopefully you've got enough, whatever it is to respond to that issue when it's happening and then yeah and and how do you deal with okay you know nuclear weapons that's pretty big but i feel like there's something in that paradigm that's all love that grace thank you <clears throat> um and we've been going kind of at warp speed in this whole call and i uh haven't slowed us down very much sort of intentionally because it feels like there's just a lot we're trying to share here but i would love to sort of go back and uh and revisit this in, in, in lots of different ways. Uh, let me try to say some of the things I wanted to say because a lot of the stuff where, where Pete was talking and everybody else was talking <clears throat> really fits. Um, so um, <clears throat> part of my design from trust thesis, uh, this thing over here uh, is that years ago, somehow we lost faith in humans. Somewhere, alpha, somewhere after the alphabet, the discovery of the alphabet before World War II, we lost faith in humans. Uh, and part of this is from Leonard Schlein's book, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, <clears throat> where he makes the point that the linear alphabet sort of changes our brains. And it's, a, it's an interesting debate, but, but we've been designing our systems based on mistrust of the average person. And when you do that, and then you go, oh my gosh, there's so many people, you begin to worry about scale in an industrial sense. And then you begin to design coercive systems. 
And I call this design from mistrust. It's the opposite of design from trust. And so we've been also then uh, ideas like capitalism eat our brains. So we design for efficiency, scale, and profit, ignoring meaning, connection, well-being, the commons, all those kinds of things. And in the process, we convert <clears throat> the commons into natural resources to sequester and plunder and people into raw materials and inputs. And we do all these weird mental conversions that flip everything around and make it really hard to unfuck the system that we're in. Um, so in the middle of that, so there's this whole idea of scale and there's lots of interesting conversations about uh, a scale. And, and I think part of the problem is that in, so industrial scale or engineering scale is, is like Intel when they create a fab and they say, replicate exactly this process. Just everybody do the same thing that, that you, here's 10 test lines for the new chip. Number three is the line that worked best. Replicate exactly all the, all the settings for line two and put that everywhere. <clears throat> but we try to do that with society. And then we create systems that somebody goes, oh, if I get in charge of the system that does all education, like the school board or whatever, then I can, in fact, shape our, our youth and change their you know, wiring for the next generation. And boy, is that great because, because scale that is engineering scale typically creates bottlenecks or pyramids. And then I think I think I said this last week, you get like Stalin says, oh, if I could take control of the entire Soviet Union, look what looky what I can do. Um, and so there's this whole notion of emergent fractal distributed scale where people adapt and where people swarm to problems that make sense to them, the way Grace was just describing at the border between Ukraine and Poland, for example, and where knowledge is shared broadly and widely instead of locked down and locked away like IP law does to us and like textbooks do. Textbooks are these wonderful strangleholds where if you want to control what people think, what you do is you go control textbooks. And uh, you know, the Texas school board has this terrible long history with, with textbooks because half the school boards in the country follow whatever the Texas school board says. And of the 15 members of the Texas school board, 10 are conservative. Shit like that happens because we've over-centralized because there's so many people and we need to do scale, right? So scale kills in some sense because we, we design for scale because we've lost faith in humans' ability to actually step up and, and solve problems. And in the process, we've institutionalized all those problems and created large scale institutions to try to solve those problems. So it's no longer, no longer my responsibility to do these things. There's a department of X that's actually gonna take care of that. And so libertarians are like, I want a, a, you know, a government small enough to drown in a bathtub. Um, I can empathize with that in the sense that there are enormous institutions that should be gotten rid of because they're busy protecting industrial scale and removing our responsibility and authority and sense of agency to do stuff. And then flush through the whole system consumerism, which removes our sense of agency and replaces um, actual legitimate society and wanting to connect with each other with sports teams and labels you can wear and expensive stuff that you want to get that your neighbors don't yet have so that they'll want what you have and all these other artificial stupid ass uh sort of uh metrics right and it's not like societies haven't always been like well i've got a nicer plot of, of rice than you do but but we've just taken that to this incredible maximum where it blinds us to the need to actually come back into society at some sort of atomic granular scale. And I, earlier in the call, I went to Hakim Bey and I didn't realize that it was the pseudonym for a philosopher who was also in my brain. So I made those connections, but he was talking about temporary autonomous zones. And then there've been some permanent autonomous zones created on earth, which I linked to today's call, which are places where there's sort of different rules. And so the Zapatistas on the Yucatan are, are like a permanent autonomous zone. They are separate from the Mexican government. They run their own government internally. Um, we don't understand what it is they do. And there's, there's other things like this in the, the Rohingya and Kurdistan, or I've, I've forgotten who they are, but there's a bunch of these interesting sort of social experiments on earth that we should learn from. And then as I think Ken and others were saying in the chat, um, there are 40,000 years of Aboriginal uh, culture that isn't a religion, but that, that has a mythology and a bunch of other things. There's probably a lot we can learn from them, which is something we've been saying on, on calls here. Sorry to go on so long but uh, there was a whole stack of things that we had touched and I'm trying to help weave them together as we are. Let's go a couple more minutes and then we'll uh, wrap the call. So let's go Ken and Michael. So um, when I raised my hand, there was a, it was a very different conversation. <laughs> this always happens on these calls. Um, I'm part of the book circle on um, the dawn of everything. And um, 
there's a question at the heart of dawn of everything that I really like, which is um, how do we get to be, how do we arrive at inequality? And so the, I wanna invert that and just, I'll, I'll keep this very brief and say, what if we began to design our systems as if we were all truly equal? We have in theory, this idea that we're all equal before the law, but clearly that is not the case when it comes to actual practice. So um, not, um, how do we make that happen? Because that puts it into the problem solving mode, but rather I'd ask you the question, what would it look like? Uh, let's get into an imaginal space. What would a what would, uh, scale and governance system look like if we truly designed from we are all equal before the law, we're all equal to each other and we all deserve to have um, a decent life. This is one of the things that in the indigenous critique, which is the second chapter of the dawn of everything, um, we find that the enlightenment thinkers were way off base and it was actually the dialogue with the native americans that that brought about the true enlightenment in europe it's like you guys you're, you have this idea that you're better than everybody you're constantly fighting among yourselves we make sure everybody has the means for a good, good life and then we once they have that then things are are um flow from there and i just want to briefly read something that gill sent out yesterday um this is from graber's book debt the first five thousand years Freuchen tells the story of how one day, after coming home hungry from an unsuccessful walrus hunting expedition, he found one of the successful hunters dropping off several hundred pounds of meat. He thanked him profusely and the man objected indignantly. Up in our country, we are human, said the hunter. And since we are human, we help each other. We don't like to hear anybody say thanks for that. What I get today, you may get tomorrow. Up here, we say that by gifts, one makes slaves and by whips, one makes dogs. So how about we start to operate from there? Thank you. That's beautiful, Ken, thank you. Um, Michael, thanks for posting what you wanted to say in the chat, but go ahead and give it a swing and then we'll uh, take us out of the call. Yeah, I just really love the tug back and forth um, on, on the issue of scale and um, I mean, the, the key thing that we get from the scale we've got is um, the, at least the opportunity for transparency on how different people operate with different values in different places. And there's, you know, the, the idea that the ways we should be and the values we should have are going to be um, bestowed on us by world governance, you know, I mean, no. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, people do want to differ. And I, some terrible things could happen at the local level if, if everyone was allowed to do whatever they wanted to, but so long as the universal value was the freedom to leave and you know that might involve UBI and and you know some things like that you know an end to racism and uh, generational wealth and a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I I I can't I can't put it in a nutshell. But uh, if anybody's interested, I stuck some more coherent notes in the chat. And, uh, and I, I, the, the key thing that it comes back to is um, interoperable standards that, you know, I, I use a food metaphor and what I'm saying in the chat, you know, that, that people are gonna eat differently. People are gonna do things differently. The best we can hope for is to be transparent, to have nutrition labels, to let people make their choices of, you know, meat is murder or not, um, and 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 let people learn, take advantage of the scale of protocol that we've got via the internet to learn from people who are not who are not in the same locale but might share the same values and doesn't involve I have to influence all the way up the hierarchy to get my nation to change its policy and then conquer another nation that has a differing policy and get it all the way down to the other end. No, people at, in that 
not not coercive power hierarchy, but in that you know sort of more species like hierarchy can realize that oh you know this way of living here in North America has learnings to have from this group of people in Southeast Asia and that one in Northern Europe. Fine, you know it doesn't mean that everybody in between has to do it the same way. And that's me. Thanks, Michael. Um, Ken, I'm assuming you're stepping in because you have a nice way to wrap our call. Yeah, it's actually nothing to do with this call. Um, in about a little over 24 hours from now, I will be interviewing our, um, our our favorite person on the call, Pete Kaminsky, for the Society 2045 call, which didn't make it into the Plex. So I'm going to send the invitation out on the OGM list. It's 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, Pacific time. There's a Zoom link. You can get it. I'd love to have some of you on the call as members of the studio audience to ask Pete questions after I'm done interviewing him. So anybody who can make it, um, please do so. Nice. We could do some heckling from the audience. Yeah, That's absolutely. So awesome except you'll all be muted. So it's going to have to be gestural heckling. That's not fair. Oh, we can no, do that. You, you can, can do you that. can, yeah, whatever you want, you know. <laughs> Mike, you have something else to point us be to? Be easy on him. He's a great guy. Come on. <laughs> One last thought. If you want a better world or at least a better web, vote for the Webby Awards. Today's the last day. Vote for the Webbies. All right, everybody. Thank you oh. very, very much. Up your empathy quotient. Great. That's right. Thank you so much. Really good. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Pete.